First of all, I must thank the organizer for inviting me to be the moderator. Uh, today's topic, this afternoon's topic is uh, whether, whether the Malaysian Healthcare Financing Scheme. Now, I have to introduce the speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be... Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Azimatun Nor Aizuddin, who is the Head of International Centre for Case Mix and Clinical Coding, Senior Lecturer and Public Health Specialist from the University of University Kebangsaan, Malaysia. The second speaker is Mr. Rangir Beer, President and Chief Executive Officer, Jibrota BSN Life Berhad. This is a life insurance Actually, it's supposed to be prudential, but uh, th there are two prudentials, I'm told. He's one of them. <laughs> He's the U.S. prudential. There's a British prudential. The third, uh, the third speaker is Mr. Azrul Mohammad Khalib, founder and chief Ex executive officer, Galen Center for Health and Social Policy. And the uh, fourth speaker is Dr. Chua Hong Tech, senior advisor, Research Triangle Institute, of Malaysia. Please give them a hand. So if you look at the at the program bad technology. Never. If you look at the program the, the four speakers are supposed to touch on um, whether the Malaysian healthcare financing scheme. And uh, there are a few questions associated with it. Where are we now? How we will get there? Uh, what, where, will, where we would like to go? Uh, so we, have, we listen to these four speakers regarding where are we now, where we want to go. But um, before I then start speaking, I, I'm allowed five minutes uh, to introduce the subject. Now, healthcare, as the YB this morning has said, is a dichotomy, private and public. But the government has always held that uh, healthcare is a social service. Is a welfare, uh, welfare uh, objective, a social service, and uh, it has been providing healthcare virtually almost free of charge. Uh, in the eighties, uh, the government already was saying healthcare is rising. Healthcare cost is rising. Uh, maybe we have to find alternative source of financing. So on came the first consultant, James Jeffers. And he, he recommended social health insurance. And he called it the National Health Security Fund. And why he called it National Health Security and not uh, social health insurance? Because uh, in Malaysia, the word in insurance is taboo, you see, to... So he, he used the word security, health security fund. And um, actually, if you look at the recommendations of uh, Jeffers, he was only in phase two. He recommended six phases. Uh, the, the second phase was the recommendation of uh, National Health Security Fund. And then after that, there were other four phases to develop the social health insurance mechanism. The organization, that is a big big thing. But I think the government just shelved it for time being. And of course, the second consultant came. In between, there were many consultants. I was with them all the time, all the while. Paul Gross, Malcolm Taylor. And then the, the second consultant came, Carol Consulting. Carol Consulting was uh, also told to have a relook at the health insurance, social health insurance. And there were two, 
two things which uh, criteria which the government gave him. Government means the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Health, the Social Health Insurance Scheme was approved by the government. One is that the basic health package, BHP, should not be less than what the people are getting today. That means must be no less. But if you look, if you look carefully at the proposal of other consultants, the present consultants, they are, even primary care, they are saying basic primary care, basic package, enhanced package. For enhanced package, you must pay. So, never mind. So, the second thing which the cow carol was supposed to answer was how we tackle the private sector. How do we pay the private sector? He couldn't answer these two questions. And because he couldn't answer this question, instead he proposed voluntary health insurance. And of course, ministry people got upset and told him to go home. And I think you know the story, he was told to go home. His, his consultancy was terminated uh, because he proposed voluntary health insurance. So, anyway, I'm not going to go into detail, but recently, again, the ministry has proposed social insurance. And in the middle of uh, this, all this, out came my salam. If you look carefully at my salam, it's actually a, a sickness benefit for those people in working, as Minister has pointed out, that uh, if they lose their job, especially those who kais pagi, makan pagi, kais petang, makan petang, uh, this is very good for them. But uh, here we are talking about healthcare financing, so I hope the panelists, group of panelists will talk about healthcare, which is a wide scope, starting from pooling, funding, uh, what type of packages we are going to give, what type of care we are going to give, and of course all this has to be in the context of the, our health system. May I have the first slide? Oh, this one, this one. Ah, you look at the WHO system, health system framework. Healthcare financing is only only part of a bigger system. So when we talk about healthcare financing system, we have to take into consideration all this, and to make it more difficult. This is another one where. All the related parameters of healthcare financing you have to look into. So it's just, just make, giving money, $8,000 to the, the people who get sick. And I do not know whether the government is giving a wrong signal or not. Whether he actually is giving this wrong signal uh, about uh, you know, getting a private care, private insurance, and look at it. Private care insurance or is it past illness, your past history of past illness, you are not in. So the the health insurance is waiting for all those working age group to get the disease. Then only they will pay. This is actually what they call a cream, some sort of cream, cream skimming. So it's here already. So I do not know whether what is the government trying to tell us. Anyway, I can talk and talk about healthcare financing. We will invite the first uh, speaker, Professor Associate Prof, to give her views. Please. You can talk from here. Or you can talk. Uh, I have a slide. Ah, can you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to all. Thank you very much to the organizer to invite me to this uh, conference. 
So uh, first of all, just like the chairman mentioned just now, healthcare financing is actually a broad term and also broad things to talk about. So I don't think I can cover within 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, as the topic is actually wither the Malaysian healthcare financing, so we are talking about more of our way forward and also our future. Okay, as uh, we mentioned, uh, the chairman mentioned just now, we are looking what uh, do we need to change and why and how and as you trust. So we need to change because there is so many things that we need to think about. Just like the ministers mentions uh, just now in our he uh, came address, so there is a few challenges in healthcare uh, Malaysian healthcare financing. So one of the, the things that even most of the things that you mentioned by the minister just now, because of the healthcare costs increased, all these healthcare costs increase is something that we cannot we cannot ask to actually stop. Okay, because there is advanced medical technology that we need to actually use it for the benefit of the community. And in fact, with the advanced, advanced medical technologies, help us in the effectiveness of the manage of the diseases. And with that also, our population become live longer. However, we also face another challenges in, in actually changing in the disease pattern. Previously, we actually faced more of uh, communicable diseases, okay, with the globalizations, our community now actually facing also non-communicable diseases. So for Malaysia scenario, we actually have two broad diseases that we need to tackle. So both communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. In fact, the communicable diseases is not remain as the usual communicable diseases, but there is also emerging, re-emerging diseases that we also need to tackle with our advanced medical technology. And with that, we actually need to use our resources effectively. With that, also, we ponder ourselves is it we can sustain our healthcare financing? Whether the current healthcare financing can be sustained? We already spent around 4.2 to 4% 4, uh, 4 of our GDP to actually uh, sustain whatever healthcare financing now, to, give the deliver, to deliver the health services to the community. And we're thinking of universal coverage. Okay, how much we can actually give to the community? And if we are really, really think about the universal coverage, are we in Malaysia actually already 100% universal coverage? Okay? With that, we actually, we need to think of what else actually we need to do okay, to help in terms of sustainability of the healthcare financing, our healthcare financing. Next thing that when we look at our challenges is the issues in the health, uh, in the Malaysian healthcare financing. So when we talk about the issues, we are talking about equity, efficiency, quality, acceptability and adaptability, affordability, comprehensive, and also integrations. So like just now, uh, the minister also mentions about uh, the WHO suggests actually to convert the curative care to the primary care and prevention, in fact. Okay, so this is something that's actually in line with whatever we supposed to do uh, our forward of our healthcare financing. So when we talk about the issues of the equity, for example, in the healthcare financing, there is many, many things that we need to think when we talk about the issues just now. So who pays actually this healthcare financing? Who pays the healthcare? So whether it's a government or community. If community, if there is a community uh, contribution, what the criteria we need to use? Is there, is there any issues of equity in uh, paying the healthcare? And how much? Currently, how much the government already spent? 4% of the GDP, both 4%. It's already increased from, uh, from the 1.8 to the 4 plus. Okay? And how much actually community will actually contribute? And what is the criteria if there is a contribution from the community? 
And how about the affordability of the, our community? How much they afford to? Okay? And whether it's actually worth it or benef- benef- beneficial for them to pay such an am- amount. And whether it's acceptable for the community to pay is also another question. And what services covered? How comprehensive is the services is? And who provides the services? Is there any integration between the public and the private? That's another, cover, another issue in terms of comprehensiveness of in the, our healthcare reforms and healthcare financing. So that's the next. Another question is financial system used. What financial system used? What is the scheme being used? Is the scheme is adaptability and also efficient enough to cover the whole our healthcare financing for now and also for future? And what is the provider payment mechanism being used? Is it the provider payment mechanism is efficiently being used? And what sorts of provider payment mechanism? And financial issues occur also efficiency, authority, hold the fund, efficiency, authority, monitoring, quality, and furthermore, is reform. So whether our health care, to prepare for our health care financing, so whether our health care actually should be reformed first. That's why our chairman is showing the complex diagram just now, say in, in, in which that healthcare finances cannot go alone. So it must with the healthcare reforms. So in terms of reforms itself, whether it's efficient actually to do such a reform, acceptable, adaptable, comprehensive, and also integration between public and private. So healthcare financing system in the world have uh, many. Okay, the main and also the big one is a taxation system that we actually currently been used. The subsequent one is a social uh, social health insurance or national health insurance or national health financing scheme, whatever. So there is a few terminology for that. Insurance is very is a taboo formulation, so uh, there is a national health financing scheme, in other words for it. Then we also have uh, personal health insurance. Okay, everybody knows that. And we have out of pocket, okay, the cash money that we, cash flow that we come out with our own packet. We have medical saving account. Okay, medical saving account is not in Malaysia. Okay, it's in other country. There's also a, a healthcare financing system available and etc. So which one is actually the one that we are going forward, going to? Which one you want to choose? Okay, look at our challenges, look at our issues just now. So which one? Actually, the answers already, somebody is, uh, actually there is answer for it already. People is talking about social health vision. The healthcare financing has been reviewed many times, and the suggestion is social health insurance or social health financing scheme, etc. So this is the trend, actually, the healthcare financing system globally. So the developed country actually use the social health insurance, but it's not a sole healthcare financing system. In many countries, it actually complements the social health insurance with taxations, and also the personal insurance, employer benefit, and medical saving. So this is a few uh, financing system actually complement each other to make the healthcare financing of the country to come better and better. For developing countries, it really started with taxation. With the taxation, there is an uh, increase in healthcare costs. People start to purchase insurance to cover for this healthcare cost increase. And in fact, people is also come up with their own cash out of pocket. And that uh, in the taxation also, we have an uh, employee benefit, uh, whether it's government or it's in, uh, in the uh, private, that we have uh, private insurance actually in the employee benefit. And we also have community financing, we have NGOs and etc. So this is a few health financing system and scheme trend. So let's look at our Malaysian situation. So we are in actually in the a developing country currently using a taxation. So when you look at this diagram, where we actually goes to? So of course our country is going to the developed countries. Okay. So with that, I suppose 
okay, and actually been suggested by ma- uh, by many uh, uh, consultant actually to go to uh, towards the social health insurance. So of course things can uh, can happen over the night. Okay, we already, in fact, Malaysian healthcare uh, system, uh, healthcare already been reviewed many times, six times. So I'm sure there is a way forward it. And I foresee that actually we are towards the nat- uh, social health insurance or national health financing. So I hope actually as academician, so that we are towards that, although it's actually started with very small maybe a puduli, a puduli sehat okay so but at least we are towards that inshallah with that i thank you thank you uh, dr azimatun the next speaker is uh, mr rangam beer Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me this afternoon and bringing the insurer's uh, perspective uh, to the discussions. As we have heard, uh, insurance is a taboo word in, in Malaysia, so hopefully whatever I have to say isn't considered taboo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's always a challenge to catch the attention of the audience in the post-lunch graveyard session. Uh, on second thoughts, I, I think that using the term graveyard is probably not the right term to use in, in, in a healthcare conference. So uh, as I've been introduced, I'm Rangam Beer. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Gibraltar Life, uh, uh, Gibraltar BSN Life Berhad, a growing life and health insurance company in Malaysia. I have been in the industry for over 22 years uh, and have spent several years of my career in Europe Africa, uh, Asia, China, India, and of course, more recently in Malaysia. I bring a broader perspective because I'm also the vice president of the Life Insurance Association of Malaysia, and during my career, I've had the privilege of forming part of the Prime Minister's Advisory Council for Health Insurance Reform in in Romania, where I spent some time. And therefore, I do believe that uh, with some of that experience, there is definitely an opportunity to bring very different and broad perspectives on the healthcare reform uh, in in the context of of Malaysia, which usually, as we are aware, is always a very sensitive topic with various divergent views on the subject. Uh, It it kind of just, when when I talk about healthcare financing, it it kind of, and, and the expenses and the increasing inflation, it reminds me of a joke of the doctor telling me that he would have me on my feet in two weeks, which he did, yes, I had to sell the car to settle the bills. <laughs> I guess everybody has a story to tell when it comes to uh, paying doctor's bills, and that makes for good party conversation. But uh, rather than diving straight into the uh, doctor's and medical bills at the first instance, I want to start off my introduction by recognizing the good news. I think uh, in Malaysia, we should actually be proud of what we have achieved. We are rather in a good state, in a good place, and we can be justifiably proud when it comes to the quality of our healthcare infrastructure and services. We have a high-quality universal care system with good access, adequate doctors, hospital beds, broad coverage of the population. In fact, I would go to say it's one of the best, better ones in the region. Of course, funded largely by the government and the public at over 51%, and interestingly, very high out-of-pocket funding for an economy of our status at 39% in terms of latest figures, which also indicates that there is a demand for better health care services by the population that is currently not served by the public system. As an insurer, we can see that only 7.1% of the funding in healthcare is covered by private insurance. Now, the government has certainly recognized the role in uh, the role that insurance plays in increasing protection. And in the recent budget, there were increases to the tax incentives to promote the growth of the life insurance segment. 
with a separate tax relief for live takaful products at 3,000 ringgit, separated from the 4,000 ringgit tax relief for EPF, which was previously bundled together. Now, while the allocation to the Ministry of Health from the Treasury budget has been going up over the years, and it stands close to 10%, the medical inflation in the last five years has been double-digit, hovering around 12% over the last three years. This indicates that the sustainability of the funding to ensure that we Malaysians continue to enjoy high-quality and affordable health care is not assured in the medium term. This really calls for us to explore alternative models for a sustainably funded healthcare system, including an active public and private insurance marketplace. The budgetary constraints are also, of course, imposed by the 55% debt ceiling on the GDP that the government is committed to. That said, I would spend a few minutes, and I know a lot of speakers have already spent a lot in terms of exploring the reasons for the rapid healthcare inflation in Malaysia, of course, and some of those reasons are still out there in terms of the change from uh, communicable to non-communicable diseases, the increasing of lifestyle diseases, the obesity rate creeping up to nearly 20% from a low of 4.4% just over 20 years ago. That's how fast the situation has changed. And similarly, Malaysia has one of the highest instances of diabetes in Asia with over 17% of the population, the adult population, suffering from the disease. So we all know we love our kueh and kachang. But that also leads to increasing usage and dependence on private hospitals and infrastructure, often paid out of pocket. The ratio of private hospital admissions is six times that of the public hospital admissions. And anyone who has a private health insurance already knows the difference in bill that privately insured patients have to pay to a hospital. Of course, we know the expansive usage of more modern expensive technologies and complex treatments, Uh, sophisticated equipment and tools being used for advanced diagnostics and treatments. We all enjoy the benefits of those advancements, and that is certainly uh, something that we deserve to enjoy. But also there are higher costs of medical uh, specialist medicines as compared to lower-cost generic alternatives. And ultimately, we do see the aging of the population in the long run. Now, Malaysia is very fortunate, and we are very blessed with a young and growing population, unlike many other countries. But our average living age is also increasing with gradual access to better care facilities. Our Prime Minister, Tun Mahathir, is a wonderful example of this long-term trend. Uh, And in fact, it is estimated that the child who will live up to 150 years has already been born in the past few years. So are we as a nation equipped to cope with all the pressures of increasing medical inflation with our current financing system, I would personally uh, state that not really. So that really means we need to consider alternative models of sustainably funded healthcare systems, including an active public and private insurance marketplace, such as a national health insurance scheme, which needs to be really a broad strategy, funded together by the state, of course, but also further financed by citizens as health insurance contributions. That is something that I think we need to consider. Our objective being to ensure that the entire population continues to enjoy higher quality health care access and that our longer-term societal needs are catered for. To be jointly administered on a public-private partnership basis so that the contributions across the entire population makes premiums more affordable. That is, that is one of the key principles that we need to take a look at, because depending on a pre- or private system that determines premiums on the basis of underwriting criteria obviously leads to individualized premium pricing and, and it differentiates across, the, uh, across the, poli- uh, the population. Coverage can be discussed in terms of basic standard healthcare coverage, covering primary, standard hospitalization, prescriptive drugs up to a certain limit, preventive services, but additionally, we really need to consider 
other cost containment measures, because what I'd like to reiterate over here, we need to review this as a strategy, not just the financing bit, because there have to be additional features to enhance sustainability, like co-payments or deductibles, which is not something that is prevalent in the market today, to ensure that policyholders are conscious about their healthcare consumption and spending. Incentives can also be provided, such as no-claims bonuses, to avoid unnecessary or overconsumption, and increasing coverage for catastrophic risks in older years as a system. So that is something that we need to consider. And we have certain examples. I mean, I would like to take a look at some case studies of established well uh, healthcare systems, maybe from developed markets, and the previous speaker has already s highlighted how, as Malaysia, we are moving towards the developed market status. So what can we learn from systems like Germany, France, Singapore? And we see always certain common features. The citizen-funded statutory health insurance scheme comprising employer-employee contributions for defined health care coverage. It's a part of the system. Supplemented by private health care insurance for additional coverage, access, better services beyond the government health scheme. Also potentially to cover co-payments that form part of the public health insurance scheme. And government subsidies can be used to cover the lower income segments, social welfare beneficiaries, unemployed, etc. It is time for Malaysia to have a widespread and constructive dialogue on a comprehensive national health insurance strategy for the benefit of the entire Malaysian population. However, the discussion, as I said, for the scheme on its own is not going to be adequate as long as it doesn't cover the sustainability of the healthcare funding with appropriate and comprehensive cost containment strategies, such as transparent and itemized billings, co-payments, incentives for shorter hospital stays, increasing promotion, uh, promoting the use of generics, regulating prices, market competition, and especially we are in a fantastic age of technology. We are able to leverage technology to increase optimization of productivity, efficiencies, increased risk monitoring, implementing a national health database to achieve targeted outcomes. With that, I would really like to kind of come to the conclusion of my a message. I believe that we are in a good place, but it's also time for us to be looking ahead in order to maintain our high quality services and take a look at the funding options because the increased inflation will make the sustainability of the system questionable in the longer run. We need to take a look at social health insurance funding options as part of a broader national strategy which can be funded through citizens' contributions who have a stake in ensuring healthier outcomes and quality delivery. And that needs to be rounded off with leveraging technology for ensuring that we have targeted outcomes, improved lifestyles, and the cost containment that we all want. Thank you very much, and I look forward to some exciting discussions. Before I uh, ask uh, Mr. Azro to speak, maybe at this half time, you know, half time, two more speakers here, two has finished, just like Manchester United, he led 2 0 at half time, 2 1. <laughs> Never mind. It's, um, you know, a very eminent economist in Malaysia has said that. Um, Tax-based insurance, tax-based funding is the way to go. And he has reasons. And if you look carefully at the history of funding, healthcare funding, the, the euphoria was on social insurance in the 70s and 80s. ILO was the one who pushed for social health insurance. So everybody jumped to the social health insurance. But... In the 90s, I think uh, World Bank reviewed this. I think you, have, you would have read the paper by Vex Staff who compared social health insurance and tax-based insurance. And uh, he found, he, his paper is that 
social health insurance is not all panacea. You know, there are a lot of problems. Tax-based uh, financing also has its problem, but uh, don't think that uh, uh, social health financing is the answer. Okay, carry on, please. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lim. I'm not sure how to start my presentation, especially with that intro. Uh, but for me, the future is social health insurance, though it sounds like it was also the past. So, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good uh, afternoon. My thanks to the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a newly launched uh, news healthcare site, uh, Code Blue ran an online survey with the Galen Center for Health and Social Policy recently, asking respondents what were things uh, in healthcare that were important to them, as well as the positive and negative aspects of public and private hospitals. The five most important things were shorter wait times at the hospital, cheaper treatments besides medicines, cheaper diagnostic tests, cheaper premiums for private health insurance and more caring doctors. More respondents said the good things uh, about public hospitals were cheap treatments and experience in caring doctors. For private hospitals, respondents liked their fast treatments, comfortable facilities, access to the latest drugs, and more attentive and caring doctors and nurses. We are fortunate, as has been emphasized throughout the day, to have the benefits of a universal health care coverage since the mid-80s. The results of the survey clearly reflect the benefits of our existing system and something that we need to recognize. If this were the United States, those concerns and priorities would be definitely different. In our discussions today, it's tempting to solely focus on the negative and not recognize the positive. Uh, we like to complain, but it is important to recognize our shortcomings in order for us to ensure the sustainability of the current healthcare framework. It was encouraging to hear the minister this morning emphasize that what matters the most is not the opinion of a Costa Rican lifestyle magazine focusing on expatriates and tourists, but the real world experiences of patients coming through the doors of our public health facilities. Ladies and gentlemen, public healthcare does not cost one ringgit or five ringgit. It never has and never will be. Yet that is often the unthinking perception of the public, those who are not yet patients at the very least. A direct consequence of having pay, uh, people live longer and increasing aging population and more non communicable diseases is a health burden which gets progressively larger and heavier each year. A the, direct, the growing burden of non communicable diseases is arguably the most significant health and financial threat to the sustainability of the existing healthcare system uh, to date. Subsidization currently is so high that every single patient entering the public system has more than 98% of the actual cost borne by the government utilizing the public purse. However, and I must emphasize here that the tax based financing system we currently have isn't bottomless and demands on it is getting ever bigger. Unfortunately, as the Minister of Health uh, mentioned this morning, simply increasing expenditure on in healthcare would not solve the problem. How it is spent is just as important. We need to emphasize on both evidence-based and value-based approaches. However, it is also true that Malaysia currently spends 4.6% of its GDP on health which is below the average of upper-middle-income countries and the recommendations from the World Health Organization. The situation is increasingly untenable and unsustainable. If we are to ensure, sustain, and grow what we have today, urgent reforms are nonetheless needed, particularly on healthcare financing. The challenge is ensuring the continuation of the provision of healthcare that is accessible to all communities and income groups. How we do this with a growing uh, population which is also aging, having changing disease patterns and rising costs of healthcare is key. Despite our best efforts and intentions, people are actually left be being left behind. Let me share this story with you. 
It is estimated that more than 37,000 people would have been newly diagnosed with cancer last year. Many will already be late stage. That number continues to grow as cancer becomes increasingly complex with patients living with comorbidities and with the consequences of a cancer diagnosis years after completion of treatment. Often when patients get newly diagnosed with stage 3 and stage 4 cancer in our public hospitals, they are told that they have come too late. The lack of available treatment options fitting their diagnosis mean that they often have to go home. For those who can afford it, private hospitals offering cancer treatment are available, especially if you're in Peninsular Malaysia. But even then, the cost of the latest targeted therapy could be beyond the reach of affordability, diminishing uh, insurance policies, wiping out savings, as we saw from out-pocket expenditure, and crippling household finances. The sad reality is that despite having the resources and infrastructure of an upper-middle-income country and world-class healthcare, Malaysia has one of the worst cancer survival rates in the region. For thousands of Malaysians living with cancer, this is how they have experienced it, and this is their story. But it doesn't have to uh, be this way. There can be different outcomes for diseases such as cancer, an outcome where we achieve a steady increase in survival rates due to better investments in research and treatment and improvements in how we diagnose, treat, and care for disease. To get to that outcome, we need to invest in a better approach to healthcare financing. Despite this year's allocation of $29 billion, uh, which is the largest allocation ever, we continue to worry about that the pool of funds will not be able to keep up with the increasing cost and burden of chronic and non communicable diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases. The quality and coverage of healthcare will suffer and be compromised due to a shrinking ability to provide the level and standards of care and treatment equivalent to an upper-middle-income country. Primary decision-making based on what we can afford rather than what is best for patients. Make no mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, a national health insurance scheme or social health insurance is very much needed today. The suggestion for this uh, properly appeared in 1996 for the seventh Malaysian plan. And as was mentioned just now by Dr. Lim, even much earlier, the discussions appeared in the 80s. So this is not a new conversation. We support the proposal of a compulsory national health insurance. It should provide coverage for all. The idea would be for a single-payer, multiple provider system where public and private institutions could be equally accessible to the patient. This would be the most efficient and cost-effective uh, system. However, this is the long goal. To maintain Malaysia's current two-tier system would require a multi-payer approach, a monthly contribution to a national pool of funds similar to what you already have currently do under SOCSO and EPF. This will be applicable to all workers and be based on the sliding scale linked to monthly income and age. There would be a collective pooling of both funding and risk. Those who are unable to pay, such as those earning the minimum wage or less than that, should be exempt. People who, who are already with their own insurance should be able to keep it. They would then be able to access both public and private healthcare facilities. Those contributing only to the national scheme would be entitled to access the public healthcare system. The above suggestions widen the funding base for public healthcare and has the potential to change the status quo regarding access and the quality of that access. This will make it possible for new treatments, drugs and therapies, devices to be introduced without solely being dependent on the yearly national budget. It would help begin addressing the issue by co-sharing the burden and responsibility of financing of the healthcare system. It has the potential to stabilize public subsidization, allow space for cost containment, while maintaining access and quality to essential services. Other countries in the region, such as Thailand, South Korea, Taiwan and even Indonesia have some form or version of this framework. But the success of these uh, reforms will depend on ensuring value for the investments made. 
We need to ask ourselves, though, when talking about value-based approaches, value to whom? It must always be in the best interests of and central to patients. When our current Minister of Health came into office last year, he emphasized on the role of public-private partnerships, and I believe this is a term that has been repeated several times throughout uh, the day, to overcome disparity and imbalance in resources, particularly in the healthcare sector. Perhaps for our purpose today, we should speak about people-private-public partnerships to meet unmet needs and start to review how we can realize concepts such as patient centricity in healthcare financing. People and patients should no longer be willing to take a back seat and passively wait for government, industry and other key stakeholders to make decisions affecting and impacting them. The days of government being paternalistic in the attitudes towards people and patients must end. Patients need to demand to be at the table whether it's about policymaking, treatment or research and development. It is imperative at this point, ladies and gentlemen, that I emphasise that the government and I reach out to our Deputy Minister here, especially the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance, make deliberate efforts to consult the necessary and pertinent stakeholders to ensure buy-in and ownership of any proposed national health insurance. The intent is not to make everyone happy, but to ensure that something as important as this is able to have the best possibility of success and the necessary support from the people. Only then can we ensure the delivery of more meaningful health care which address the priorities and needs of people. Ladies and gentlemen, significant gaps in Malaysia's health care continue to exist, what, but we can do better. We are an upper-middle income country, just about to become a high-income country. So let's change the conversations. Let's change the language that we use and ensure that we have a healthcare system deserving of all. It cannot be business as usual. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Chua Hong Tech. Before I give him the floor, um, I would like to... Dr. Chua, I, read, I saw your slides. I read your slides. It was sent to me. So now I have four slides. So I'm going to give you a question. Give you a question even before you present. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because a lot has been said already. So the question is, is the government doing enough? If you look at the statistics, 4% GDP. And actually... Government is only spending 2% GDP. The other 2% is from the private sector. 2% GDP. And if you look at your, your slide, it says uh, 8% of government budget. Is it enough? So, I'm not going to answer. answer. You answer. You know. Is good, the government doing enough? All right. Uh, thank you, doc, Dr. Lim. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, YB, Deputy Minister, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting uh, me and uh, RTI International. Uh, we have maybe just as an in introduction, uh, RTI, RTI International, we are actually a research triangle institute. Who are we? We are an independent institute that provides research, development, technical services to government and commercial clients world worldwide. We set up our office uh, in KL, uh, what do you call last year. And the RTI healthcare practice in Malaysia, we look at uh, three different areas, major areas, pharmaceutical, healthcare system, as well as aged care. And, and in uh, part particular, just to highlight to you all, we have a RTI Center for Healthcare Ad Advancement. We have about 30 years specific industry no knowledge, and we have about 600 staff in this uh, area looking in into various uh, we have various capabilities, and one of them is on healthcare fi financing. Okay, my presentation overview to today is what is the current state of healthcare fi financing? What has been done over the years? Okay, I, should, I will give you what has been done and some recent development, and my views on what next must we do. For this, we look at some statistics on healthcare 
financing. All these st- statistics are based on the national, uh, uh, what you call, healthcare fi- financing statistics produced by the Ministry of Health. Huh? This is the latest, uh, 2017. Okay, for total expenditure on healthcare, we spent about 3 to nearly 4.4% per, per, in uh, 2017. The question I always get is, 4% is it enough? Uh? WHO always say 5%, but actually WHO never say what go 5, 5%. There's a wrong uh, what go perception, you know. It is not the amount of how much you spend. It is what we aspire to be. What the, is the outcome? Everybody says in Malaysia, very good out, outcome. If it is very good outcome, 4.4%, en- enough. Lah. So Dr. Lim's question is, ask, ask me, is 4.5% enough? But actually, what do we want to what, uh, achieve? Is our health care outcome good enough or not? That is the question, not the amount we spend. Okay, total health care expenditure. What is this 4.4%? Per- it's nearly 58 billion in uh, 20, uh, what you call 17. Just to, for those who don't know, this is the amount we actually spend on uh, what you call healthcare. And this is actually on an in- increase. Uh, for the last five years, uh, the increase is about more than 10, what you call percent on what you call average. Okay? So it is actually quite a hefty, uh, what you call, in- hefty increase. Let me next go to this. Source of fi- financing has reached nearly 50, 50, 50, nearly 50, 50. That means the sources of funding from the public is 50%. Sources of funding from the private is 50, 50%. So actually, Malaysians are actually are very good, you know. We take care of our own health, you know. Can you imagine uh, if all of us are here, uh, we don't want to take care of our, ourselves. We want to rely on the government. Uh, can we do that? I think the, 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 the government has to re- realize that a lot of people, not only they pay tax, but they buy their own insurance to take care of themselves and their family. We should actually salute them rather than a lot of people say, oh, private insurance is what got no good. You know, you increase health, health, health care costs. But... Can you imagine if all these people, these people and the companies do not take health insurance and rely on the government? Can the government what got afford? Our tax, we may even have to increase our what got tax. Okay, sources of what got financing. If you look at sources of fi- financing, I want to highlight to you the three main. Ministry of Health is still the biggest as 43 what got per- percent. Out of pocket, okay, everybody say, oh, out of pocket here is very high and all that. I will give you the details. What is actually out of pocket expenses? Then you, then you tell me whether that amount is, is, is high or not. And what can we do about it? Private health insurance is only 4 billion. Is it high? It's only about 7 what got percent. And this, this 7 billion, or, or the, the, four, the four billion, these are the people who pay tax as well as they take their own what they call insurance. The pro- pro- providers of healthcare, if you look at providers of healthcare, hospitals and ambulatory care consists of about nearly 76 what they call percent. So most of it is spent in the hospitals, about 55 uh, what they call percent, and ambulatory care is 21%. Next, out of pocket. Okay, this is a very interesting thing that a lot of people have actually mistaken. When they just look at the gross number, wow, so big. You know, we spend uh, sources of funding 38% out of own pocket. But if you look at the de- details, outpatient services, out of the 21 billion out of pocket, about half is actually out what your patient. Malaysians can afford. How many times do you go and see a GP in, in, a, in a year? Five times? Maybe if you have a children, maybe they fall, fall sick more. Ten times? But GP services is relatively cheap. 
people can pay out of their own pocket, if people want to pay out of their own pocket, why, why do we want to what do we worry? You know, the worrying part is actually, you look at it, is the inpatient services. The inpatient is 24 percent. But then, okay, this one and that is about five, five what got billion. But but the in inpatient, a lot of them actually they can they can uh, what go afford if they just go for one 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 two days. If they are middle income and they want to pay for for their you know in inpatient, be it then they are taking care of themselves. Okay, the. Those who cannot afford, they won't go to the private or the hospitals. Obviously, they will go to the government. So I think the, the, the concern is not the 38 what call, per, percent. For me, as far as I'm con, con, concerned, out of the 21 billion, the concern may be the 5 billion. What can we do to that? Can we convert them into uh, what call, in, insurance or not? You know, do they want to protect them, themselves? Because some people may not want to take an ins- what they call insurance. They say they can, the, they can protect them, uh, what they call themselves. Next, what has been done over the years? As what Doc, Dr. Lim said, I could have listed, we have done in Ministry of Health, the government has done about 11 uh, what they call studies, starting from 19, uh, what they call it, uh, 85, the healthcare, uh, service, uh, healthcare services financing uh, Study. And then we have also done so many other working, we have a lot of studies and working papers that are related to healthcare system and healthcare for, uh, what got financing. And the most important thing is there are a lot of studies on DRG case mix, but we have not Im- implemented it, even though UKM has already implemented it. The other important one is the Malaysian healthcare uh, what call a- accounts. This is, this is a very good thing because right now, we can get uh, access. So most of the information, the statistics that I'm giving you today is on the national health, based on the national health accounts. So you look at it, over the last 20, 30 years, there are three main groups that I have uh, put them down. Is The first one, in the 1980s and, uh, 80s and 90s, this healthcare financing study. It is done in EPU, uh, and uh, it was based on National Health Security Fund, as what Dr. Lim mentioned, is on social in- insurance. The other era was during the big era of corporatization and what got private uh, what got There are many companies that went to Ministry of Health and say, "Okay, we will manage the so-called the fund that you all are going to uh, co- co- collect." It started with uh, RHB. The next one, this one was done by Ministry of Health. As what uh, Dr. Lim mentioned, the Carol con, uh, what call Consulting, that was funded by UN, UNDP. According to doc, Dr. Lim, they mentioned about uh, what they call social insurance. But for me, they were looking at earmark tax. Okay, Ministry of Health did not agree. Ministry of Health wanted social health insurance. They talked about earmark tax. Okay. Next. Some recent development, okay. Recent development, I'm sure you all heard about this. I shall not go. But for me, this is the first time actually the government is actually doing not a big bang what got, uh, what got approach. Previous government, they always want to do the big bang uh, approach through social health in, in insurance. That's why it has never been able to take off. We cannot do a big bang uh, what got, uh, approach. So this new government, what they've done is you know this uh, from Paduli Sehat Selangor. They have now uh, they have come to the the scheme uh, my my saham. And before the the former government, they were talking about voluntary health ins- insurance. They are based on the Malaysian healthcare system reform by uh, what called Harvard. Harvard actually produced volume one is in the public uh, what they call domain. Volume two. I hope they can put in the public uh, what God domain, you know. And the deputy minister is here, so uh, I hope the because we spend a few million dollars asking Harvard, but it is not in the public what God domain. Okay, and then the what God Perker, everybody knows what uh, Perker is. So what next? For me, 
I don't think so. We can revamp the whole system. In the, what we wanted to do was a uh, social health insurance. We should not. We will never be able to do it. Can you ask people right now to contribute their money into a social health in, in, insurance? You think the people are willing to trust the government, even though it's a new government? Everybody, what do you contribute? No, no. What we want is actually, for me, the tax-funded system, we must protect and strengthen it. We have a good system. Why? What is wrong with the tax base? The tax base system, if you look right, right now, is, is a new universal health coverage. Not many can, countries. No matter how rich or how poor, you can go to the public health system. But what we don't have is universal health access. The access and coverage is what we call different. If you live very far away to get access, you have coverage. You can go to Ministry of Health as a coverage. But to get it, a lot of implants are not supplied by the Ministry of Health. Okay? Ministry of Health only collect, as what Azro mentioned, we only collect 2% of what we what we spend. No, not we. La. I used to work in the government. Okay? So, no. okay? so what I'm talking about is more co-payment, maybe earmark tax, and more so we never want to talk about this now. How efficient is Ministry of Health? How efficient? If you look at WHO, uh, they are talking about most healthcare sy system. This is according to WHO. There are no uh, studies. Uh, about 20% are wastage. I don't know how much is wasted in Ministry of Health. But nobody wants to talk about it. Since I've already left the government, I can talk about it. Okay. Private health insurance. The one that convert the, o the OPP, the 5 billion that is paid out of pocket, we can convert that into insurance. And one more thing, insurance company. I talked to my friend here. Coverage for pre-existing ill con condition. You have a pre-existing, you are out. I think that is not very fair. We should follow the, what you call, Obamacare, where pre-existing conditions are covered. Okay? And have family plans. Right now, if you look at private, private uh, health care, it's all individual plans. Maybe we can have family plans so that we can, uh, what you call, sub subsidize each other, the, the whole family. The other is medical savings accounts. Uh, Singapore has a very successful medical savings uh, account. When we talk about medical savings account last time in the Ministry of Health, they always talk, oh, our salary is too low, how can we save? But we should encourage what people. If they want to save for their family, why not? And the last but not least is this public-private co co collaboration. I think it's time that we sit down, really sit down, and see better utilization and shared utilization of resources, including facilities, equipment, human resources, both the public and private. It's just always talking, talking, no water action. It's better now with a new government, we hope, more, more uh, action than talk. Lastly, we cannot have a sustainable healthcare fi financing if we do not encourage healthy lifestyle. Okay? Healthy lifestyle for a healthy, productive, and progressive nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chua. Time to, for Q&A. Uh, before Q&A, may, maybe uh, I tell a story first. The story of Korea, South Korea. South Korea, from the multi, multi, multiple insurance, they came out with a national health insurance. And uh, what happened? They based their premium on certain things. Two things they wanted to do. One was separation. Dispensing, and, uh, dispensing from the doctors. Dispensing separation. The other one was they wanted to do away with fee for service. What happened? What happened? The doctors went on strike. Three days later, the government agreed. Yes, using the national health insurance, carry on with fee for service. Okay, no, uh, no uh, separation of pharmacy prescribing and consultation. What happened? In five years, they, they went bankrupt. Yes. And, and when they went bankrupt, what did the government do? 
they, they earmark, they call it syntax of alcohol and tobacco to give it to the health, national health insurance. After five years, again, already in the red. So we need to learn from Korea. Anyway, I have other stories to tell, but not here. Yes, Ken, time for questions and answers. Yes, Dr. Baskaran. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Speaking in front speaking in front of you is always worrisome, uh, Dr. Lim. You must be scared. No, no. I just want to mention this because my president is sitting here. He has been going through this national and financing for the last 35 years older than me. I've also heard this for the last 30 years, meeting, meeting, meeting. Only thing today, the deputy minister is sitting throughout the meeting. That's what he needs. He needs a clap for that. Normally, deputy ministers will run away. So apparently, they are serious. But I think, whichever design, everybody spoke. I've heard all these different, different patterns. When are we going to decide and run something? Definitely, it's not sustainable. Everybody knows. The government cannot go on paying. They'll become bankrupt. And then, you know, the last government came in. I don't know how many of you enjoyed this. Opened 357, one Malaysia clinic, Satu Malaysia clinic. All the cars that were parked there, all the Mercedes, BMW, and came and took all the medicine and finished. Now the government has decided this is a waste of time. That is why the primary care physician like us are suffering. If this job was given to us, I think many of you don't understand. No? Medicine is not an easy subject. But we also stand in the last part of your life and hold your hand and say, please believe in God. Because we can't do anything else. But the problem here is, the come on of money that has been spent, wasted on this kind of militia clinic and all that. We are the frontliners. But can you believe, everybody is denying us for 20 over years our fee schedule. Everything has gone up. Ours is the only thing not being paid. They want everything free. How do we give free? Secondly, the other thing I can tell you, just mention to you, Formima, look at Formima. Foreign workers, 20 years, the fees are the same. They say people will complain. Which people will complain? You mean to say you cannot give me 25 ringgit more? After 30 years? You can, isn't it? But the problem here is nobody wants to take into account the various sectors what we can play. The primary care physicians are the frontliners. They need to be taken care of in order to take. Not because we want to be rich. All those past fellows have become millionaires and finished. Now the young fellows, the 500 clinics have closed down. Not because we want to make money. They must leave. We cannot go on living like this. The rest of the buggers have supported the country 7 billion and we are still sitting in the roadside and waiting for patients to come. I suggest you all come up with a concrete idea and sit down and finish it once and for all. It's fed up already every time coming and listening and going back for doing nothing. There was another speaker here. Please allow him. One senior, one junior. Yeah, I just want to ask about DRG case mix. So my name is uh, Dr. Jason from CERN. Um, there are a cu- couple of articles has written that DRG case mix, um, we, it will actually reduce cost of healthcare because of price transparency and then at the same time uh, improve outcome of care. So my question is, uh, based on my interaction with some of the insurance uh, companies, so I think this is probably for Prof and uh, Mr. Um, so they told me that a lot of the pricing are based on the Schedule 13. So I just wanted to know, at this stage, have we actually implemented that DRG coding system with between the uh, care and uh, the insurance companies? And if, if it's not, uh, when is the projected timeline? And if it does, uh, will it actually Im- you know, reduce the cost of healthcare eventually? Just wanted to know. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Namazi, then I'll... You want to answer that first? Okay. Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, so, DRG case mix, currently in HUKM, you are using that. So, from the DRG case mix, we come up with the hospital tariff. So, in which that we can see really what is our expenditure, and it really can be used for the projection of whatever expenditure for the hospital. And that is actually can be used also uh, to benchmark and also for the uh, subsequent uh, uh, expenditure. And in the DRG case mix, it's actually we really measure the cost of the treating a patient 
according to the patient's disease, according to the patient's uh, uh, diagnosis, severity, so procedures and everything. So to come up with a DRG uh, case, uh, case mix uh, costing and also tariff, we consider many things. So not just, just the drugs, the procedures, it's also the human resource and everything. So from that, actually, we can estimate the best uh, estimation for the cost of the healthcare. In the Ministry of Health, there is also a case mix uh, being implemented. But this different case mix uh, is a my DRG case mix in the Ministry of Health hospital. But it's not all hospital yet. But in HUKM, we have our own uh, case mix that we, are, we use and it's also been used in whole Indonesia. The whole Indonesia is using our uh, HUKM uh, case mix system. So that's the use in the insurance. In Malaysia, not yet, but in Indonesia, the case mix insurance HUKM goes to Indonesia, trend the Indonesia, Indonesia how the hospital and primary care and etc. to use the case mix in the uh, healthcare expenditure as a whole for their jam, jaminan kesihatan the whole in Indonesia. Uh, maybe I can also just provide an added response uh, to, uh, to my uh, colleague over here. Uh, from an insurance perspective, as she, has already, as she has already kind of indicated in her response, from an insurance company perspective, we are actually, uh, from an insurance industry perspective, we are actually a big proponent of having a high degree of transparency, implementing standardized coding across the country so that uh, billing can be made transparent and billing can be made itemized based on standardized coding. The challenge is UKM has implemented one type of coding. Uh, you have a different type of coding, uh, let's say, in the Ministry of Health. You have That is not standardized. And this is, from an industry perspective, this is something that we are a big proponent of. This is something that we have proposed also together with the Ministry of Health to bring the key stakeholders together to be able to arrive at a standardized uh, coding system, which allows for higher degree of transparency, which allows for higher degree of benchmarking and makes it very, it makes it a level playing field where people can then take a judge judgment on what are going to be the true uh, treatment costs associated uh, to, to, uh, towards a particular treatment or procedure. And, and we are a big proponent, but that is not existing in Malaysia today. Okay, thank you. Before I give the floor to you, Dr. Mazi, I would also like to comment on this DRG business. This DRG actually it was developed in America actually for, for an episode of care, urgent care, acute care, not chronic care initially. It is for acute care. Never uh, mind. We, we have got acute and chronic patients. But if you look at the, the title today, is Changing Landscape. Do you know what, what the landscape for payment is now, is now on? Uh, instead of one episode of care, admit, pay, go home. Now we are looking at a whole ep bigger episode. Okay, admit, uh, follow up, go to go to community homes or old folks' home. All this is part of care, and maybe we have to look at bundle payment. This is all bundling together instead of we are we are trying to fragment care, you know, and, and pay by by episodes. This is uh, going to rise the. She wants to respond. Okay, uh, so actually, the calculation is based on per episode, but you also actually calculate all the things, the follow up, and etc. It's not purely per episode, uh, uh, doctor. So it's actually as a whole, we also have. Uh, in, in fact, now we are actually developing and it's already implements our primary for primary care, follow ups, and also dental, and a few more for the uh, for the. Uh, Case mix UKM. So we already collaborate with USM, and uh, uh, inshallah, in future, just near future, is with BPM and other universities and other hospital, private hospital also. Thank you, thank you, Dr. UKM and all are very wise. Yeah. Let's hope MOH is also wise. <laughs> Please, Dr. Namazi. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lim. Uh, I have a lot of things to say because I have been involved in this from 1985 when the Westinghouse came to do the studies. Because Westinghouse 
uh, the, the doctor assigned to Westinghouse was my medical officer at that time. But in 85, I was already in private practice. So he called me, hey, would you like to meet? And I was also involved with the medical association at that time. And, uh, with the, and then uh, what happened was they interviewed me. Westinghouse interviewed me on the health care. So from then till now, till the latest Harvard group that came, I have been interviewed, just like Dr. Lim. But some of them, uh, you know, uh, I missed all the small times. But Carol Consulting, yes, I was one of them who went to talk to him. And uh, 1985 is uh, watershed for as far as the medical profession is concerned. Because the Director General of Health called upon the President of MMA at that time, 1985, was Tansri Abu Bakar. He was the President of MMA. He said, can the medical profession, we are going to have national health insurance, can you come up with a fee schedule for the profession, for the doctors? We came up and the first edition was given and then every five years we revised the schedule. In 1992, there was the third or uh, second edition because first edition came in 87, 92, the second edition and it was mentioned the out-of-pocket payment, 40% is for outpatient. And it was also mentioned by the speaker that it is very cheap. Why is it cheap? Have you ever asked this question? Why is it so affordable? Because somebody else is subsidizing. Who is subsidizing? The GPs are subsidizing. I am not a GP. I am a specialist. But I can see what is going on. Because can you get anything for 10 to 35 ringgit. A medical consultation for a general practitioner in the schedule today is the 1992 schedule. Please take a note, everybody. It is 10 to 35 ringgit. What can you get with that type of fees? And that is why it is cheap. It is not that... Uh, I, mean, uh, I, I, I mean, I get very angry, you know. Because the government is not paying attention. But this time, I thought, you know, the new government, the previous government, you know, I, I've also been the chair for the fee schedule committee of MMA for the last 15 years. All right? Working on this. And we have come to the sixth edition. And I have given, the, you're talking about the coding, common coding. We have already given the common coding for 6,000 medical procedures, including vaccination. We have already given them. But who is taking it? Nobody is taking it. 6,000 procedures have been coded. The procedure codes have been given to them. Of course, DRG coding is separate. But the procedure coding, if you, if you are looking at the ICD, you also have the ICD-CM. ICD-CM is the clinical modification for procedures besides the diagnosis. We have given the procedure codings and we have given the relative values for each uh, procedure. But who is using it? And we have spent hundreds of man hours in the medical association doing this coding. All right? And we have come up with that. Nobody is paying attention. 1996, we came up with the publication. The uh, MMA came up with the publication under the presidency of Dato Dr. McCoy, Health for All, Health Reformation of the Malaysian Healthcare, 1996. And there we put forward our vision for health reform, that is social health insurance in 1996. And whatever Dr. Uh, Rangam had said in his uh, presentation, it is there if you go and see that. You know, everything was covered. And today we are sitting in the National Health Policy Committee of MMA. Dr. Lim is also a member of the committee. And we are still discussing it. You know, but we are going nowhere. There must be some uh, initiative, a political will to move forward. And I completely agree that tax-based uh, system is not going to be sustainable. Are we prepared to pay 40-45% tax to maintain that type of uh, health care? 
there must be contributory social health insurance, risk pay, I mean, risk pooling, resource pooling, and that is the way to go forward, together with, of course, the, the diagnosis-related grouping, because fee-for-service can also be a bit uh, challenging in this type of uh, social health insurance. Thank you. No, huh? Any more comments? Yeah. Since the time is up, uh, can all of you join me to thank the panelists in the usual manner?